Lisa Leong, how lovely to have you on my show. Great to oh. have you in from piped in from down south. ABC yes. broadcaster, uh, a, a woman of many talents, and most recently author of This Working Life, How to Navigate Your Career in Uncertain Times. Thank you for coming on the show. Lisa, in your own words, who are you? I'm a lover, not a fighter. I mean, <laughs> you know that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think in essence... You know, I'm someone who's really curious and I love other human beings and I think I try and see everyone as whole human beings. So that's me in a nutshell. Well, it, it seems like the idea of knowing who you are is a central tenet of your book. And, and how do you decide that you actually know who you are? Yeah, I mean, I think for me it's the, it's the not knowing. <laughs> so... I do see my life as being in a lab. I say every day is lab day where what you get in your experiences are like data and you look at each experience and you say, what did that, um, what is the lesson in that? Whether it be my preferences or what I would never do again if it was a project that you didn't like doing or if it is a project that you love doing, what, was it about that? What's the data there that shows me that it lights me up and I'm in flow? Mm. And so with that curiosity um, and that lens of every day's lab day, um, that's how I figure out well, who I am. But I feel like who I am changes over time, you know, mm. whether it be, you know, the young me or the older me. Um, uh, the tired you, the energetic the, you. The, yeah, that's why the work is never done, is it, Minta? <laughs> well, so you describe uh, this lab day uh, thanks to your prior career as a lawyer. What does that technically mean, making a lab mm. day? So you, you have this notion of, of listening in to what you're feeling. How does that go about? Yeah. So really this experimental mindset comes from my time, as you intimated, um, studying science law, and which was a really unusual co um, combination that was offered at Melbourne University, but there was only a handful of us who would do it. Now, the lawyer's mindset and the science mindset are a little bit different, shall we say. Yeah. And I was actually really bad in the lab. So I'm like a failed scientist in a way because I did organic chemistry. It's a lot like cooking and I can't cook. So hmm. I actually had one lab evacuated, Minta, <laughs> because I was um, basically doing a lab experiment and then um, created a poisonous gas instead of... Uh -oh. <laughs> so the lab got evacuated. Run for your lives. Run for your life, Lisa Leong is in the lab. But the one thing I picked up, Minta, is that, you know, when you run an experiment, how you've got a hypothesis and basically you're testing it. That's the whole point. And mm. when you hit a positive result, it actually means you need to keep on searching. You haven't reached the edge of the hypothesis. So actually when an experiment fails, it's kind of richer because you go, ooh, okay, I've hit the edge of something. Mm. So then you go and, and it's actually quite useful because that's a boundary. So the experiment fails, you don't fail. It's not that you as a scientist are a failure. And I think that's a really important point mm. to pause on. Because in life, when we have a failed experiment, so when something goes terribly wrong, often we turn on ourselves, I am a failure. Whereas what I learned through science is that, no, <laughs> it, I am not a failure, right? Right, it's the experiment the, that's failed. The experiment fails. So let's then extrapolate. So if every day is lab day in our own lives, Minta, then... Every interaction, everything that happens to me, I'm going, hmm, how fascinating. And that's a little catchphrase that I learned from Ben Zander. He's um, the conductor, uh, a world famous conductor. And if you think about you know, high powered talk. stakes, right? Yeah, how mm. fascinating. And I love that. Of course, we all want to be as excellent as we can be. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you've just got to uh, allow yourself to be human. <laughs> Maybe that's ultimately what it boils down to yeah a, a friend uh becky wrote a book called a nut be around the t title is when is enough enough yeah. and, and that idea of, of not because you, you want to be excellent but you also can't be perfect 
and yes. you want to be excellent, but you've got other things you want to do, and things mm -hmm. crop up, and unexpected things happen. So how do you how do you balance that that notion, let's say, of ambition, which certainly underwrites a lot of your career, with that ability to accept imperfection enoughness? It's uh, a, another catchphrase that I learned from a friend of mine who's a Baroque musician, best in the world, once again. And she learned in her world that this phrase of everything matters and nothing matters. Mm -hmm. So I love, I love complexity, by the way. So for me, you know, there is no black and white. So if we go with nuance, then everything matters and nothing matters. So yes, we strive for that, you know, the perfect um, run if it is on Baroque viola. For me, it's, uh, you know, the perfect uh, radio broadcast, you know, an interview that goes swimmingly well. Of course, we're aiming for that. We're preparing for that. Mm -hmm. And then nothing matters. At the end of the day, we're a human being on a spinning planet. <laughs> you, mm -hmm. know, you know, there is nothing mm -hmm. more that we need to be other than in that moment just being and enjoying if i take it the other way around if if um everything doesn't matter yeah then it's like well who cares who yeah why bother exactly so that's why um it does matter but then at the end of the day well you know so yeah. that's why it's not you know even when i was writing the book um it is not a book that tells you the answer, Minta, right? It yeah. just helps you ask better questions. And, you know, my love is interviewing. And at the heart of interviewing is asking a genuine question mm. <laughs> with curiosity and openness and then opening every pore to the answer that the person is giving you. And letting that sit, kind of. Um, and so in that asking that question, you know, that is the essence really for me. Well, the, there are certainly several books that talk about the art of asking questions. And, and maybe the thought I had going back to your scientist, lawyer, uh, by, uh, I don't know, a different uh, two different careers, something that... <laughs> that both of them tend to do well is ask questions. Yeah, um, that's beautiful. And in science, there's a hypothesis. And so what I love about that is once again, you're holding it lightly, aren't you? You're asking mm. that question of the experiment and saying, could this possibly be true? And why don't I test that, right? And then observe the data, so beautiful. Now in law, you know, it's critical thinking. So, you know, and what's really interesting if you boil law down is very often we're looking at every infinite possibility, uh, predominantly of what might go wrong, but you can actually mm. apply it, the critical thinking to extrapolate, okay, what are all of the things that could happen here? So it, you are taught to think critically. And I think, um, you know, that's the part that I found does intersect when it comes mm. to science and law. I mean, it was a great course to do, program to do in terms of, um, learning different paradigm and how to think. Yeah, and, and to speak on your feet perhaps as well. I suppose that's if you're in <laughs> court. One of the expressions you, you, you say, and, and it reminds me of, of another friend of mine, Ray Shanahan, to name her. She talks about holding things lightly, and you've already used the expression. And mm. in the book you write, I held the radio gigs lightly. This idea of holding things lightly it feels like that's the middle ground of it. everything matters and nothing matters. Yeah. Um, there was a phrase that we were taught when, when I was learning radio at the Australian Film Television and Radio School. The head of radio, Steve Ahern, uh, gave us this. He said, um, who will you be when the on-air light switches off? So the on-air light, it comes on when you're broadcasting. Um, to indicate, tell people, you know, be quiet, you know, you know you're, we're broadcasting now. So it does represent the, um, you as a radio professional. Now, in radio, of course, we have personas. We become maybe fairly well known on the radio. If you identify with that, you know, is what Steve was saying. If you think that you're lethal Lisa on SAFM commercial radio station and you identify with that person, that's quite 
quite a dangerous place to be mm. because if that on-air light switch is off, when that on-air light switch is off, in whatever role you are, whether you're the CEO, a manager, a worker, if you identify solely with your job and you lose that job, then you could lose your sense of self. And actually, that's not what life is. You are not your labels. That's an important point. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it, it's not just a, I mean, it, it's the expression within the radio life, but it's something that I see a lot in any business where people identify with, make extrinsic importance about my title, my the pay and all this. And I think it's, it feels like, I said at the very beginning, it feels like one of your central tenets in your book is this notion of you got to be ready to be who you are. And, and there's so many people who still think that, well, to be a great doctor, I just have to be, I can be a dick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or like, you know, I, well, I'm just the CEO, I've got to do that. And, I, and it doesn't matter how I do things almost. Uh, at home, I'm a lovely person. At work, I'm a dick or vice versa. And it, it feels like those type of discourses are, are bound for illness. I agree. And I think that when you are misaligned in that sense, that it does come back in a way. It's like your – I mean, I heard it described as um, – you know, there's this love, which is a, it's like a life force. And when you damn it, you know, when you dampen it and you, you know, damn it like um, waters, like a big wall, it will break out at some point. And so you can't dampen the inner self that kind of wants to be expressed. And it, I think it, come, it, it does come out maybe as a heart attack or an illness or something that kind of breaks in you mm. or you will just feel this sense of, you know, longing, a sense that I can never feel whatever hole I'm feeling, no matter how successful, right. how much money, you know, yeah. how many external accolades, how many awards, why do I still feel this? just a gnawing little sense of something. And so I, I would pay attention to that because that's data, as I was talking about, mm. this idea of what am I feeling or thinking deep down, that's data. So as much as I'm talking about data on the outside, I'm talking about your internal felt sense mm. Mm. and going, it's giving me a signal of something. But of course, you know, you need to be fairly quiet, don't you, Minta, to feel it. Mm. And, and that's the work because we are – filling our lives with a lot of things. I am Busyness. absolutely a person who does, who, you know, has a full dance card. And so am I giving myself a chance to catch up? And very often after, you know, six months, I go, no, I'm in my head. Um, and so after six months, I, well, I take myself away now, Minta. And I think um, this year I found myself in that state. It was, I was feeling in May, oh, I'm so in my head, I'm ruminating, I don't feel like myself, I might have lost my joy and I couldn't get it back. I'm a biohacker and I could not biohack my way out of this. Mm. I tried everything and I was still feeling stressed. So that's my indicator. I'm stressed and I'm not being my nicest self at the moment, um, but mainly to my nearest and dearest. So mm. what's going on? And I happen to have booked um, to come to the US and to go straight to Omega Institute and to learn Qigong, you know, um, mm. it's like a cousin Energy. of Tai Chi. Yeah. yeah. With Robert Peng. And because it's body work. So I went and did that, uh, learned with Robert Peng, met beautiful people and ate healthily. <laughs> and wow. Do you know, halfway through, I was walking through this garden which I'd never, I'd just kind of walk through because I needed to walk through it to get to where I needed to go to. Mm. And I was just looked at this little bee playing across these flowers and I noticed it and I thought, ah, I'm back. I love it. 
Mm. What was What's interesting for me about that, Lisa, was well, first of all, you, you basically you're giving permission not to have to do the daily check because you you, you sort of said, well, at six months I got it because otherwise, if we're in this constant checking mode, it's like you you, you don't get off the pot. Yeah. And I guess what well, what do you mean by checking? Because let's look into that. I wonder um, what 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 do you think is normally the practice with checking? Do you think? Well, I think that most people don't check in. They're in this yeah. running mode. They're they're yeah. doing Just mode. The they're doing. Not in a, so they're in doing. The, yeah. You're not the being, and yeah. um, so I personally find it really useful to have a time when I set my day on the right path. So I have now a, yeah. a pretty solid regime that just 10 to 20 minutes and I stretch because I am a very stiff old man nowadays. <laughs> and and I thought that it would be a, a metaphor for what I needed to do, which is become more flexible. Yeah, love it. Oh, nice. Where we have uh, all our wiring you know as you get older it's yeah. more entrenched and and the idea of of i i can now kiss my toes which uh, oh, i could only do last when i was and what a lovely a baby. way of putting it <laughs> and then I, I do I, I listen to my body and i'm so i'm trying to get much more in touch and it's something i've been poor at in the past but so that's that's like in, in on a daily basis but at the same time like you don't have this big check-in Sort of no. like when you oh. go to a hotel and you and you check in, uh, yeah. and this is this is my life, because if you're if you're constantly meta, observing your life, then you struggle to live it. Can I pick up two points on that? I love Do. that, and I love kissing your toes. Oh, okay. The first part um, to talk about is that idea of a morning routine or some sort of routine or practice, which nurtures and nourishes you. And absolutely, you use the data in your life to build something which absolutely suits you. So I think the thing about a practice is um, not to listen to somebody else's practice because I actually mm. get up really early. So before our conversation, even though we started at 6, I built in getting up at 5, 5 a.m. So if we, if we were going to have a conversation at 5, I would have got up at 4, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So I had an hour. And I do my jigong. I have a practice of getting into my body as well. And for me, you mentioned the flexibility. So for me, it's about becoming aware of my energy and connecting to or grounding myself away from this busy head. Because mm. I wake up with, you know, ideas already. And so I'm just doing a practice to do that. So that's the morning routine. And I have always had a morning routine which I just love mm. and it's quite long like it took me an hour <laughs> mm. the second part is and this is something I'm actually working on like it's like a, a something that I'm trying to do more regularly which is an awareness practice Minta of it's an informal mindfulness practice that just has have and I think I'm trying to make it subconscious like a habit mm. of just the bringing awareness to, as you're saying, that meta state of the world is disrupted and chaotic, but actually I'm okay. <laughs> mm. You know, bringing awareness to in this moment I'm fine, you know, um, or bringing awareness to physiological signs, mm. hungry, angry, <laughs> you know. Tired. Stressed, tired. And then thinking, oh, okay, so no big decisions now. So at the end of the day, because I get up so early, I'm pretty spent. My battery's quite low. Resilience is low. Oh, am I feeling triggered because I just need to pack myself up and go home? <laughs> mm. So I, that's my two sort of builds on um, mm. what you shared, which yeah. is I do think – you know, like I'm not leaving it for six months, not even thinking about it, but just um, right. daily awareness, even especially being triggered, Minta. I mean, I think I do a lot of um, uh, facilitation of offsides, but instead of thinking as a, a group, as a one big blob, you know, I'm looking at the humans that make up the group or team 
and trying to absolutely see each person exactly who they are, as exactly who they are. And in doing that, I think, you know, that when you're looking at people as individuals with all of our hopes, dreams and fears, that um, very often we are conditioned to save ourselves, help, help ourselves in childhood or later in life. And very often we can be triggered, as you know, just to accidentally jump back into that protective self. Mm. And so I'm just looking for evidence of that just to go, is this really the data that I was given? So Minter or somebody else said something that made me feel something Mm. like my inference from the data of your words was way more emotional, had way more sting than the actual words and possibly your intention. Right. So I might flare. Mm. Do you want me to give you an example? It's kind of embarrassing. Okay. Try. I had um, not been invited to a particular gathering at my old college, but I wanted to catch up with someone and they said that they were going to be there. So maybe I could just drop in. So basically, you know, I was just um, gate crashing. <laughs> right. <laughs> so there's a gathering and he wasn't there yet. So I kind of was there without him. And so I was just sort of milling around and someone sort of came up to me and we formed a little group and it was chit chat. And she said, are you starting or are you finishing? Okay. So she said, are you starting or finishing? Now, remember, so where I was in my old college now, I am 51, but I look a lot younger. I'm really, really tiny. <sighs> I have a bit of a thing around people thinking that I'm younger than I am. Right. Are you starting or are you finishing? And so I'm like, bloody hell. She thinks that I'm still at college. Yeah, 30 I years got ago. Really, I fled big time. And I'm like, well, actually... I started college in 1990 and I finished in 1993. And so she, it was obvious that I was pissed off. So she promptly left the group, <laughs> right? Anyway, so she's kind of mills herself off, right? And then a friend of mine, so this guy who I was meant to see, he's still not there. So a friend of mine who happened to be there, she comes up to me um, and she goes, Lisa, I haven't seen you in ages. Are you starting? Are you finishing? And I'm like, What? Huh. Are Uh-oh. you talking about, turns out this is a prestigious, Minter, I'm talking like big time, ethics, leadership, scholarship for incredible people who were very advanced in their careers to learn about leading Australia. Are you starting or are you finishing? Because it was graduation of these amazing people that first lady thought I was one of the amazing scholarship people, <laughs> right? Yeah. Can you see the data? Are yeah. you starting or are you finishing? Yeah. There's a ladder of inference. Um, yeah. Roger Schwartz teaches this. So the ladder of infer- inference is like a step ladder. And I went all the way up my ladder of inference until no I was on. To- yes. No, it was just the... The data triggered yeah. my conditioning of, oh, bloody hell, everyone thinks I'm so young. Yeah. And can you see how I then went all the way up the ladder, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. far away from the actual, her intention, yeah. and I didn't ask her the next question. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Well, it's so, like assuming innocence, right? <laughs> it's assuming that there's an innocence in that question and the Assume filter. The best intentions or just be yeah. curious. I lost my curiosity. I mean, the thing that I yeah. say is my superpower. Right. And, and I was interested about the, the, the type of, of interviews you hold. I, I think it's relevant in off mic, if you will, is, is, or the, the sessions that you run where you have multiple individuals, how, what do you, what tips or tricks do you have before you enter in a room where you have to work mm. the room? Yeah. Or or before an interview where you want to get to that zany, interesting, deep dive question. Yeah. Because in the end of the day, you can prepare, 
but somehow there's an element of this which is deeply human. Yeah. Um, so I'll take that in two parts because in the facilitation, so when I'm facilitating, as you say, you know, a group of people, if it's not too unwieldy, so we're not talking thousands of people, so but it could be up to 100, I will get a list of all the participants and I will actually um, – look at their uh, LinkedIn or their, you know, as much as I can about them and just try and get a sense of who is the person coming into this room, um, a felt sense of um, maybe, you know, whether they've stayed in Australia the whole time or moved from somewhere, just a really nice sense. So I definitely do the research and see, once again, see each people as um, each person as a person. Uh, and then I prepare my intention for them, not for myself. So that idea of how would I love them to feel? What are they feeling now? How would I like them to feel as a result of this one day together? Um, and I b start building a safe container as soon as they get in the room. So I don't expect people to embarrass themselves or do zany things. You know, I let the trust and the safety build and from that natural humor and levity comes out and I let it breathe and I let it come from them so that's the first part is that when you give people permission you know I'm pretty daggy so you know pretty dorky when you give people permission then they can be that freer self so that's one thing mm. the for interviews you know once again we learned in radio school prepare to be spontaneous prepare to to be spontaneous so yes mm. you're doing your prep again I would always read the person's book and for me it's not just about the content of the book but it's an empathy exercise for me mm. so you know I'm getting a sense of this person through their words and through their thoughts and mm. once again their hopes and dreams and fears just through the essence of the book so I would prepare that and then hold it lightly to use that phrase again mm. Because if you overly prepare and if you hold it too tightly, you're going to miss that human connection. Yeah, if it's so, too scripted. Yeah, if it's too scripted. And then there's a little courage point here. So when you're in that moment of facilitating or interviewing, can you be in that moment and trust that you will have that next question or that something will happen rather than overly needing to prepare what you are going to say next. But that's a lifetime, you know, piece of work around what I say, listening with every pore of your body. Mm. And I think that's a kind of skill we could do with more of off radio. I mean, amongst ourselves, that ability to listen to what the other person's saying, go with them down the rabbit hole that they're saying and their feelings and, and focus in on them rather than bring it back to me. Yeah, and, and Minta, you know, it's funny because I sometimes talk about, you know, interviewing skills or um, techniques, but actually I don't really believe in that. Oh. <laughs> so if it's helpful, if it's helpful for people, then I can try and distill things into skills. But the thing thing about the listening piece or the interviewing piece is I lean a little bit or what I find helpful in terms of frameworks is Dr. Dan Siegel's work on uh, interpersonal neurobiology. So he's got these beautiful phrases. One is attunement and then the other one is resonance. Mm -hmm. So attunement is that, you know, when we first start talking, I'm trying, it's like I'm trying to tune into your wavelength, mm -hmm. trying to get Minta. So mm. tune and then resonance is actually where we start um, getting into sync a little bit. Mm. Okay. Um, and then that's the beautiful part where we're exchanging. So it is a two way thing, it's still a mm -hmm. human connection. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm playing a role and you're playing a role, it's that we're sort of um, in, you know, resonance together. Another way, I, you know, I playfully call it mind jazz, mind jazz, mm -hmm. because you've got your instrument, that's Minter's instrument, very unique to you. 
I'm playing my instrument. I'm not reaching over and playing your instrument. I don't have to be <laughs> you or, you know, like, you know, mirror you. You're right. Minta and then mine jazz. Yeah. So I'm going to, you are you know, I'm, I'm playing a tune here. You're picking it up and then you're doing your own little riff. And that's what I think is a beautiful conversation is when you're both playing mind jazz. Yeah, well, at the, at the, what it, it suggests, I think, is that inevitably as the interviewer, you are also bringing something to the table. I think so. Um, I think when I'm doing an interview for a broadcast, um, I think in that conversation I would generally be keeping it shorter obviously for my thing and I would only probably share things if I thought well this is useful for the conversation mm -hmm. um, and, and definitely playing around with sometimes you know short questions are you know really nice you know the oh why or you know mm -hmm. tell me more you know those types of things so mm -hmm. I think I think when it comes to the interviewing format particularly if you've got an expert then you know definitely you wouldn't it wouldn't be like 50 50 airtime no 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 yeah. I, I i when i look at my uh, tracks I, I i tend to try to stay under about 20 percent of the yeah. amount of time so i i do think of that because sometimes i yeah. want to tell stories and and stories are okay to, to share they can trigger as well trigger other thoughts and stories yeah. So there are a few things I wanted to I, other you have so many wonderful things in your book and and uh, I I don't know which ones we're going to be able to get to but um, one of the things is this idea of a portfolio career uh, yeah. it's, it's not a piece of cake as you write uh, it seemed like time management is a fundamental element of that being punctual seemed to be a fundamental element to you. Do you think portfolio careers uh, are, are for most people, some people, weird people? Um, <laughs> so this concept I loved when it was shared um, with me by Dory Clark, who is a coach in the US. Um, oh, I know Dory. She's been on yeah, my show a few beautiful. times too. Oh, well, yeah. and when she shared it to me, I loved it because we talk about side hustles and there's different ways of looking at people who don't just have one full-time job, basically. You're, you've got a portfolio of things that you do which make up a career. That's the way of looking at it. And like an investment portfolio, it's like you're diversifying your interests. Mm. So Dory does it because it gives you longevity in terms of your career. As we saw with COVID, you know, if one thing drops off, then you've still got something else. So that's the concept. Um, I like it because, you know, we talk about bringing our whole selves to work and sometimes mm -hmm. your whole self can't um, be in flow with one job. So for people who kind of have different interests and who feel like, oh, you know, and I would say maybe it is a lot of us, you know, we have many different things that we do. Um, I see a portfolio career as an additive thing not a destructive thing so when i'm broadcasting live broadcast radio on a sunday and i've got this working life which is a podcast highly produced show i see that when i do those two things they add up and make me a better listener interviewer and then i also do facilitation at offsites as i said that also helps me um, because then I'm also in the real world. So I can mm -hmm. then bring that into my show mm -hmm. as well. So that's what I call and that's my mindset around a portfolio career so that I don't feel like I'm being pulled or there's tension. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Practically, what you talk about time. So in radio, um, we learn how to time out. So when it comes to the top of the clock, the ABC theme will play and it plays regardless of whether I'm ready or not, right? So I can start a sentence and know 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Before that, I was always punctual. I think it is for your own good, but also a respect thing for everyone else. And also um, I use time blocking in a practical way. Have you heard of that? I have. You know, it's, yeah. So I love it. Near aisle, and the color um, coding. I do the color coding. So if you As look at my I. diary, I bet you our diaries look the same. So every single hour 
is kind of blocked out and as you say in color so the blue for me is transiting to places but also rest recovery Mm. and when you look at my diary it kind of looks frightening because it looks like I have no spare time but actually I'm just blocking out the health things first so healthy things are yellow um you know the transiting is blue and and I transit by riding my bike Mm. so actually I've got quite a balanced life even though it looks frightening for everyone else (laughs) well that's a that's a moment where you're transiting and doing a little bit of health yeah that's right so I think that's what I think is a portfolio career but it just happens to suit me as well because I'm just uh innately curious and I like to start things <laughs> yeah you're also very active right and, and so yeah. you have that desire for many things you've got many talents many skills and and the, you would feel probably closed in if you just had one thing to do yeah totally <laughs> so, so it, it works for it, me it speaks to another element which you write about which I, I really enjoyed and um, I thought it was very refreshing work-life coherence Ooh. rather than this notion of balance, which I've, I've always thought is misplaced. You, you mentioned before, like, this is something that maybe many people do. I think it's probably not everybody, because I think you, I maybe, have seen a lot, done a lot. We've been very privileged, and, and we've been allowed to do much more than just be a, a builder or something yeah. like that. So the idea of balance, especially we have ambition, is is a tough thing to actually settle down you yeah. it's hard to succeed at everything but work life coherence really resonated for me how did you how, how do you come up with that what is your work life coherence look like yeah so work life balance i feel like it just puts too much pressure on us and then you know is there any real delineation i'm not sure so we left that behind there is uh, the concept of work life integration which is, that's a nice word as well. Coherence Mm -hmm. is kind of, uh, so it comes from heart coherence. It's a physiological term and it, and it's always moving. Like it's kind of like little um, movements of that sense of it actually is working as a whole. It's organic. It's organic. And you know, that concept of job crafting. So Amy Renewski she has done a whole body of research. Her life work is on the fact that we have more agency in our jobs than we think. And what's interesting about her work, so it looks at um, relationship crafting. So who do you kind of um, uh, work in relationship with? It looks at task crafting. So what are you doing in the day? And then cognitive crafting, like how am I viewing my work? The thing about her work, which is fascinating, is that Uh, Well, one example is hospital cleaners. The happier hospital cleaners saw their role when they were asked to describe it as, I help people heal. And it's just a beautiful, I help people heal faster and with more love, right? The sad at hospital cleaners, I empty the waste paper basket, you know, I do blah, blah, blah. So... She had so much power in no matter what you're doing. um, You can be happier when you see the agency. So even um, when you are working in a job that people might think is really restrictive, she says her research shows that people will find a way when they want to be in flow. So it's kind of a mini challenge, I think, uh, a compassionate challenge, Minta, for people who think, I'm just going to do my job. It's just a job. And then I will live my life outside that because you spend a lot of time at work. And once again, that misalignment of I'm going to be incredibly, <coughs> incredibly unhappy, you know, for the 10 hours, seven hours, five hours I'm at work, that's a lot of your life to waste. It so strikes me. Work life yeah, coherence I, is trying yeah. to address that. Sorry, it, it, it strikes yeah. me that that idea of agency, I feel it, it, it is incumbent upon the hierarchy to wish to allow for agency, to guide people to understand that they're doing something bigger than just cleaning the trash. Because I, I would suspect that a lot of people will feel that they don't have agency because they are mismanaged, 
they're overwrought. They're just told you all you do is got to clean the bloody. The idea of of, of a person in the hospital who who can come up with that kind of a a purpose as an enlightened individual, and I think it it, it is important for us. Even like when you're walking into a room, like you were saying with a seminar, bring them to that place. Allow them to feel the authority to come up with something bigger but that has to be known right because if that individual in the hospital has that idea but no one else understands it that way well i mean what's really out. interesting is in her research it shows that um these enlightened individuals will do it whether or not it is mm. um there is an imprimatur to do so and often they might even bend the rules so one of the rules is um, no, say it was like no visitors at this time or you are not allowed to change the paintings on the wall, the hospital clean and just change the paintings anyway or just let the, you know, people sneak mm. in. So there, in her research it says it happens whether or not you want it to um, and it doesn't matter what the managers think. However, I think imagine if organisations were enlightened, as enlightened as those individuals, then of course that's a beautiful flourishing organization and mm. there are organizations that are like that and that mm. of course then more people um will be job crafting and enjoying and then their retention rates will be higher mm -hmm. so that is the difference between an organization which is losing people because after a while of course these you know people may leave right the paycheck um, isn't and, enough yeah so especially if it's a toxic environment. So, mm. you know, I don't think there's anything, you know, in my thoughts or in the book or in the world that says you need to stay or you should stay in a toxic mm. environment um, because the thing about toxic environments is you, an individual, can't change that. So you mm. might go in there thinking that you're the silver bullet, even mm. if you're the kind of lead, one of the leaders, but actually you kind of change to the environment. So... Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's better to leave. <laughs> well, it's like we were saying before, and, and you talk about how you got shingles. I yeah. myself got uh, type 1 diabetes for not being in the right place. So, you know, get it, it can have mm. real consequences on your health, that sign of toxicity. I mean, that's what yeah. toxic means, right? It's, it's sickening. The yeah. last thing I want to talk about, just for the few minutes we have left, I mean, there's so many other things I wanted to get into, but I'm going to leave it with this or, or work in this space. Uh, it seems so important for you notion of time, not just management, but past, present, and future. There are several times you talk about it, specifically you were saying about um, how your father informed you that the future is rooted in your past. And and, uh, and then you, you have other moments where you were quoting Greta Bradman, who talks about how our values come from basically past, present, and future. So mm. I don't know how you want to riff on that, but it seems like not just time, but time, present, past, and future is also important for you. Yeah, I think um, in that work or the coaching work that I do, I think I recognize through having conversations with people how rooted we are in our past and how it plays out um, sometimes in the present and really just bringing awareness to that. So, you know, we talked about being punctual. Well, I always thought it was just because dad told us to be punctual. So I knew that it came from dad. He taught us to, all, we were always early for every single party, right? And I just thought, oh, well, that's because dad is a punctual person. No, I found out that it's because his brother used to have to pick him up. So he was a, came from a very poor Malaysian uh, country town called Ampang, but his brother used to have to cycle from work from Ka uh, Kuala Lumpur, come all the way, and he was often late. And dad, um, you know, everyone had gone home. He was a tiny little boy, and it was he was so scared, and he used to have to hide behind the big trees and wait for his brother for hours and hours until it was dark and he was alone. And then his brother would come hours later, and he that feeling of being scared that's why he's always on time and early because mm. he hated that feeling so knowing that i'm like oh my god this is like really pretty um it's it was a fear-based response from dad so mm. i have a choice minta and 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 that is that because i can get really anxious stressed about being late but at what cost 
So mm. I'm not running for a bus. I'm not running for a tram. I've got to understand that actually those decisions are really important and I'd rather arrive and be late than not arrive at all because I have had mm. friends running for a bus and unfortunately um, being killed uh, by running, you know, doing a dangerous act. Yeah. Because they didn't or driving too fast. Yeah, all those things, right? Mm. So it can also free you. It's not, it's not shackles. Well, what I like a lot about what you said, Lisa, is this notion of nuance. There are various constructs you have, but it seems to be a lot of it is working in the middle. Uh, you, you work it well, Lisa. So um, for anyone who's listening, how can they get in touch with your work, Lisa? I, I'm not going to ask them to personalize that but what would be the best way to get your book uh read what you do stay in touch see what you do for a living in terms of uh, your portfolio of material uh so i'm quite active on linkedin i've found that's a, a good place for me <coughs> given that a lot of my excuse me a lot of my work is um uh yeah it's good for you know, a lot of the, th the thoughts that I have. So I put a lot of thoughts on LinkedIn and Instagram as well under Lisa Leong. I think I've got an S in the middle, so Lisa S. Leong. And mm. um, website as well, lisaleong.net, which is coming soon. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, I'll put all that and a link, of course, to your book. Um, which do you prefer, Schlonger or Quiet Flower? Ah, uh, <laughs> Love it. Yes, I do have some very random nicknames. As I mentioned, middle name is it starts with S. So S. Leong is Schlonger. There you go. That was my college nickname and it makes me laugh. And then Quiet Flower because obviously I'm not very quiet. It was given to me as a Chinese name when I was in Asia um, leading a team. And so somebody did that ironically. Haha. <laughs> and so the... But the name is beautiful. It's Jinghua, quiet Jinghua. flower. Yeah, but then people were, would laugh when they saw well, my uh, name. Well, on those <laughs> lovely laughing words, Lisa, thank you very much. Thank you, Minta. What a great conversation.